example, if there's no other questions, I'd just like to review what we did last week and then frame the video we're going to go into and uh, get into that. So last week, we, the week before, we ended up going through the various types of ecological symbiotic relationships. And I mentioned that ecologists have this broader view of symbiosis as any interaction between two individuals and different species, regardless of the outcome on the individuals. Um, it doesn't have to be a mutually beneficial interaction in an ecological context because ecologists see these relationships changing through time or co-evolving. Um, so I also mentioned that generally, um, whenever we get a young symbiotic interaction, a young ecological symbiosis, these are usually not very productive interactions. They're usually quite harmful for the parties involved, and they tend to be very energy inefficient. And I said that's why we don't want to be moving organisms from one part of the world to the other is we create these young symbiotic relationships. I gave the example of the chestnut blight and the fact that this was not just a problem for the American chestnut, it was a terrible tragedy for the fungus itself. And that eradicating its host to such a degree really hampered its, its ability as a species to thrive and multiply and do everything else that it should be doing. Um, so in the natural world, energy efficiency um, is what natural selection is always urging species to move toward. If they can become more energy efficient, since energy is a finite resource, um, any organism that does that can support a larger population on the same amount of energy. Any organism that moves in the opposite direction towards energy inefficiency can support as big of a, a population. And through time, the energy efficient strains just push out the energy inefficient strains. So, uh, Coevolution, all being driven by energy efficiency. And what this does is, through time, coevolution being driven by energy efficiency causes species to become more specialized. And the nature of their symbiotic relationship being more energy efficient and usually more beneficial. So I gave the example of the bull's horn acacia in its resident Azteca acacia ant as an example of a symbiotic interaction that probably started as parasitism, probably predation, where ants were stripping leaves off of acacia trees, but not a very energy efficient thing to do if you want that continuous resource as a food supply. And somehow, natural selection kicked into gear and forced those species up into this present day mutualism, where both species have become incredibly specialized to each other, so they have to interact to survive. They, they need each other as a partner because they can't make it on their own. <coughs> we also looked at competition being in ecological symbiosis, where both individuals are losing energy through their competitive struggles. So if they can figure out ways, um, and actually they're not figuring out, this just happens, but if they develop ways that allow them to avoid that competitive overlap, they get an energy boost. So what this does is competition through time in the natural world forces specialization. So Species can coexist without energy losses. Uh, and it's a very different model. Our model in our world is competition. Usually you want, you know, it's winners or losers. In the natural world, they're both winners because they can both still coexist in that system and boost its biotic diversity through that. And then we also looked at um, coloration schemes in both predator and prey to show again through time uh, species become much more specialized whenever they take on a certain coloration scheme. It limits their behaviors. It limits the sorts of substrates or environments they can be in. And that all this through time <coughs> boosts the amount of species and ecosystems, boosts the repetition of function, and thereby the resiliency. So I'm just going to put on the board what I put on last week. And I don't know if this is, I don't think this one will work. Um, well, maybe I'll just go through it, and I won't put it on the board, but I said, we start with energy efficiency that's driving coevolution. Coevolution causes species to specialize. As species specialize, their ecological roles or their niches get smaller. As in an ecosystem, niches are getting smaller, it means the ecosystem through time can support more and more and more individuals or different species. Um, as you do that, your repetition of function in critical functional roles, whether it's decomposition, pollination, photosynthesis, increase. As you get more and more different species doing that, those increase, which gives rise to repetition of function. 
which is that decentralization aspect of self-organization, which gives rise to greater resiliency and stability. Now, I don't want to just focus on the diversity piece here. It's that whole model of just showing how we get more and more biotic diversity in ecosystems, um, which is self-organization through specialization. We're building up the complexity of that system. But the other critical thing we don't want to lose sight of is that all those species are integrated in meaningful ways where each species doing what it needs to do is creating conditions that support the whole ecosystem. There's nothing out there doing what it's doing out of its own interest that's creating conditions that are detrimental to the ecosystem, unless it's maybe a, a very young symbiosis. But the ones that have co-evolved, everything they're doing is doing in ways that make the ecosystem more resilient and more stable. Um, so that's sort of where we ended up last week, and then we went out into the field for a short time to look at some examples of co-evolved interactions. But any questions on that review that people have? That whole, for, for at least for the people who were here last week, that making sense. And when are humans ever going to figure this out? Well, I think we're starting. I hope we have enough time to really figure it out. Uh, but yeah, I mean, this is something we need to really, <coughs> really need to understand as humans and bring it into our human systems. I wonder if that example of moving species across the planet, creating that young symbiotic thing, is part of the human issue because of oil and transportation oh. and resetting the. It's very much a human issue. Yeah, we're the we're the vector of that. Now, the only other way this happens is when you know through continental drift. You know, we get major land masses coming together that have been apart. Well, that is going to happen naturally. Like I said, it happened about three million years ago when South America and North America ended up. Well, then we had a lot of young symbioses coming into both continents. But now, after three million years, coevolution has worked those all out. So they're all now in functional roles. But yeah, we are the vector today. In this but I didn't mean that we are the vector, but that metaphorically, that's our issue because we're moving around creating young symbiotic relationships to each other as opposed to being in a stable place. Well, that too. That too, I'd say. Yeah. I would think that would be accurate as well. Anything else? All right. Then let me frame this um, video we're going to see. And we didn't get any markers? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh. Right oh, great, great. So let me just frame this video um, that we're going to see. What it is, it's a documentary called Castles of Clay that was uh, filmed by Joan and Alan Root. And they were really good natural history uh, film documentaries that did most of their work back in the 70s into the early 80s. So this is an old thing. This is a this this documentary was done in 1978. So we're you know closing in on 40 years now. As you'll see it, we're not going to see all the digitized sort of stuff we see today, or some of the dramatic footage we see in documentaries today. And yet I think it's probably one of the best natural history documentaries ever done. Is what they captured, I think, without even realizing it, was incredible examples of self-organization uh, in the natural world. So this um, documentary just focuses on African <coughs> termites and the African termite colonies and how they function. And you're going to see that within these termite colonies, there's an incredibly high degree of self-organization. All these different termites that have different specialized roles in the colony but all completely integrated together to make this a very functional system. And we're talking about colonies that can have 10, 20 million individuals in one colony. But within there, we've got these different classes of uh, soldiers. Uh, we have different classes of workers, uh, all very specialized in roles they do. But luckily, they're integrated together very tightly through chemical communication. And that chemical communication happens. Whenever two termites meet, they basically exchange saliva. And their saliva is constantly incorporating the conditions within the colony. So quickly, that communication goes through to everybody and uh, tells everybody what's going on in the colony. And uh, then other communication comes from the queen in response to that that dictates to everybody what they need to do to correct situations that they're getting out of balance. So it's really, really very self-organized. Um, another amazing thing about this, the, the termites we're going to look at are not, um, do not have mutualistic gut protozoans or bacteria that break down cellulose. These termites um, basically create compost heaps and grow mushrooms. And then they eat the mushrooms and they eat the compost together and the, the mushrooms have the enzymes to break down the cellulose and the compost. And what you're going to see is that 
these ants are actually um, farming mushrooms to collect s spore crops to inoculate new compost gardens. So every spring when they get the rainy season, they take their old gardens apart, spread them out over the whole area. So now all the fungi can grow up the actual mushrooms that produce spores. Then they collect the spores and inoculate new fungal gardens. So this is a really amazing mutualism because the ants can only survive with their species of fungus. And the fungus can only live on compost heaps. It's not ants, I should say termites. And the fungus can only survive on compost heaps with their correct termite species saliva in that compost. They cannot make it independently. They're, they're so highly co-evolved and specialized. So we're going to look at that. We're going to see the <coughs> internal self-organization. But the other beauty is how since 90% of all the energy in this ecosystem <coughs> is moving through the termites, they are the energy conduit. So the whole ecosystem is completely co-evolved <coughs> in these relationships <coughs> with them. We're going to see all these very specialized predators of termites. In fact, the Ard wolf. Probably the most specialized mammal in the world, 90% of all its diet comes from one species of termite. And we don't have any mammal that, that is that specialized. So it's a marvelous representation of both self-organization within the termite colony itself and self-organization within the larger ecosystem within, within which that termite colony and all these other species interrelate. And I'm sure if you ask the roots, well, gee, you, did, you know, if you mentioned this when they were around filming that, you say, wow, you're doing a great job <coughs> self-organization. They'd say, what? We're just filming termites in their ecosystem, but they really captured it in a marvelous, marvelous way, and that's why I think very highly of this. Now, to frame this a little further, I want to make an analogy. <clears throat> and I want to use a cell and the type of chemical communication that happens in a cell as this analogy. So here we have the nucleus in which is the DNA. And that's the nucleus, and then out here is the cytoplasm. Um, the DNA in all of our cells, as within all organisms that have DNA, that stores basically the blueprints for making proteins. Uh, in our bodies, we, we need about 100,000 different proteins. So we have about 100,000 different functional genes that code for the production of those proteins. But the information in the DNA cannot get out into the rest of the cell where the proteins are made. The DNA is trapped in here. Now I should mention, in the nucleus of the cell, we do have these large portal, portals called nuclear pores that do allow large molecules to move through, but the DNA itself cannot get out. It's too big. It's just sort of housed within the nucleus, protected there, holding all the uh, blueprints for making proteins. So what happens is, in a cell, in the nucleus of a cell, the DNA gets copied into messenger RNA. So this is a copy of an individual gene. So it's a smaller fragment of molecule, although it's still a very big molecule. We're talking about a molecule that's you know, thousands and thousands and thousands of atoms in size. But that MRA is small enough to leave the nucleus and go out to where proteins are manufactured. So this is almost like analogous to the old sort of the way architects used to work before we're in a digital age. They would draw plans. Those plans would always be kept in the office, but copies or blueprints would be made and taken out to the building site. So this is the same idea. The original plans of the DNA are held in here, the nucleus which is like the office, but copies, messenger RNA, go out to the building site. These then are used as templates to build protein. And then the protein controls the DNA. So the way this works is, let's say there's some protein out here in the cell that is needed. There's not enough of it. A chemical cue is going to come into the nucleus and basically turn on the genes and the DNA that code for that protein. That section of DNA will then copy itself to messenger RNA, which will go out back out here where the proteins are being made. When enough protein is produced, other chemical messages come back in and shut that DNA gene off. So this is a very nice negative feedback loop. So, you know, let's say right here, we'll start with here. The amount of protein goes down. A chemical message comes in which turns the DNA on. That is an inverse relationship. As DNA gets turned on, it produces messenger RNA. That's a direct relationship. 
as messenger RNA is produced and comes out in the cytoplasm, that produces the protein, the direct relationship. When enough protein is produced, the DNA is turned off. When the DNA is turned off, the mRNA is turned off. When that is turned off, the protein goes down. So it's a very nice negative feedback loop, again, with one inverse link here, um, all done by chemical communication. Uh, and it's marvelous. It's one of the major uh, negative feedback loops that keeps all organisms functioning correctly. And again, it's a great thing. We don't have to concentrate about this because we have 100,000 proteins at any one time. Any cell probably has as many as 20 or more genes being turned on and off. It's happening in microseconds. Gosh, we had to kind of, if we had to like orchestrate all that complexity, it would be mind-boggling. Luckily, we can just go la la la, not even worry about it, and it just happens. It's really miraculous. Um, now, the reason I'm mentioning this is the termite colony works in terms of its communication in a really, really similar analogous way. So we can have the termite colony like this. Now these colonies can be huge structures. The above ground mound can reach heights of 30 to 40 feet. They can be as big around as the area you're all seated in. <coughs> um, they're huge. And they're basically made out of hardened mud that's almost like cob or concrete. But below the mound, a few feet down to the ground is an open chamber, and within it is a structure that is sort of suspended on columns. And this is the royal cell. Within that, the king and queen termite are trapped. They cannot get out. They build this and case themselves in, and as we're going to see, the queen is very much like the DNA in the nucleus. She has all the information for running that colony, but can never get out to the rest of her termites and tell them how to do it. So it has to all be done through chemical communication chain. Now, these portals here are very similar to the nuclear pores and the nucleus. Worker termites can go in and out. The king and queen can't. So um, within the colony, as termites meet each other, they're changing saliva, giving a constant feedback on what the condition of the colony is. Let's say the colony is warming up. Because the termites like to keep their colony within a degree of 85 degrees Fahrenheit. They keep it very carefully controlled through negative feedback loops. So let's say the temperature is going up above 85 degrees. The termites on the colony register it. They're kissing each other. The queen, because she, as you can see, is so big, she can't do anything for herself. She has to be fed. So when the workers come in to feed her, not only does she get the food, but she gets a chemical message saying the colony is getting too hot. Then from her abdomen, <coughs> she can release liquid in, encapsulating chemical messages. The workers go in, they drink that, and all of a sudden, that's instructing them what to do. They go out, they start kissing each other, and all of a sudden, all these workers start going down as much under 20 feet underground, drinking as much water as they can, coming up and painting the walls and the inside of the colony until evaporative cooling brings the temperature down to 84 degrees. <laughs> Queen gets another chemical message, temperature okay, she shuts off that chemical message and the whole thing stops. Um, if, for example, the, let's say there's a struggle and the amount of soldiers drops below 2%, that's, that's where they want the amount of soldiers to be in the population, 2%, they get lower. <coughs> Just through chance encounters, the workers figure out they're not encountering as many soldiers, a chemical message in their saliva is conveyed to the queen when they're feeding her, right away, the next batch of eggs she produces are all soldiers. Until that level comes back up to the 2% level, a message comes back in, and then she goes back to producing the <coughs> correct balance of workers and soldiers. So it's, it's very analogous with the queen being like the DNA, stuck in the nucleus, but she's stuck in a royal cell, and chemical messages going out to instruct what has to happen out in the body of the cell or colony to keep it on that even keel behavior and negative feedback coming back to tell the queen when that has happened and she can shut that message off. So it's just an incredibly marvelous system we're going to see here. But before we go to the video, any questions about this at all? Very humble and impolite question. Yeah. How do we know all about this movie that ants function, the queen function, yeah. the throne function? It's, it's, How did we know that? it's been done through tons of research by, you know, doctoral students and PhDs and everything else. Um, as we're seeing the video, there's a lot of amazing video footage they got here. 
I'm quite confident they probably had to do a lot of this inside. They probably had to bring a termite colony into a structure, let it build up around their cameras and stuff. Um, but we can we can actually see this at play in the video. So when there's this, this degree of specialization. Well, when you get um, species like termites, hymenopterans, like bees, wasp hornets, they are super organisms. And in these colonies, um, the only individual that reproduces, the only female, reproduces the queen. All the others are sterile females. Um, so in a way, they're all part of one organism. But it works for those sterile females because, I, I, I can't get into this, genetics get very complex, but it's called haplodiploploidy. It gets very, very complex. Um, but the sterile workers, via this mechanism, actually get three quarters of their genes passed when their mother, the queen, is doing all the reproduction. Um, if they reproduce themselves, they'd only pass on half their genes. So actually, from the sterile worker's point of view, they're getting a better deal. More of their genes are being passed on the next generation if they reproduce themselves. But it is very much like a superorganism, and the queen becomes sort of the brain and endocrine system. Uh, the workers become like the proteins and muscles and everything else. Uh, the, the chemistry is sort of the nervous system. Um, the queen is also sort of the reproductive system. So yeah, it's very much like a superorganism. Yeah. I saw something like this when I was young in Africa, and uh, I couldn't see inside, but I could see the outside. And the outside was kind of like an apartment house. There were other yeah. creatures who lived in their own apartments on the outside. Oh yeah, we're going to yeah. see a lot of that yeah. in, this, in this documentary. Yeah. Um, just in terms of the question of <coughs> the sex determination, there's a really great TED talk about sex determination that explains that fairly well. What is this uh, type of intelligence called? You've got the cell intelligence, you've got the organism. Yeah, um, maybe super, super organism intelligence. I don't know. I mean, it's what it is, it's just a great representation, again, of self-organization, which is something that really works in complex systems. It's That's the beauty about it, is you can take any complex system. If it is self-organized, it's going to work really well. It's going to be sustainable and resilient. And if you move away from that, you get systems that are, that are not. And, um, I guess what I'm asking is, what's, what's the, uh, the process that allows for these kinds of things to develop? You know, why, what is it that allows our body to function? It's self-organization. It, it just seems to be, just as we have gravity and we have the second law of thermodynamics, self-organization seems to be an embedded law in our universe. Any systems that can capture energy and can self-organize become functional, sustainable systems. It's just part of the fabric of how things have developed here. And there may be a lot more to it than that. I think we're just in our infancy of understanding it. You know, some people could say, well, it's, you know, the way the deity set it up, and that may be the case. Um, or maybe it's just a law of the universe. Who knows what? But it's here. And it's something we need to understand and, and incorporate. Well, does it need to be a separate law other than evolution? I mean, if you have basically um, what you're talking about, uh, advantages of energy efficiency driving the whole thing right and then if you have <coughs> random variation that occurs and they the uh, the the systems or variations that are the most um, energy efficient are the ones that are are going to continue um, so in the, you don't need you don't need a separate um, in a sense law of gravity or self-organization uh, beyond evolution yeah. Well, uh, certainly the, the ecological, biological sense, I think that's true. I think we can see the same thing, though, in human systems. There are human systems that have gone through self-organization, which may not be necessarily an evolutionary process, but they've done very well, where the ones that haven't have, you know, usually end up collapsing or having no problems. Uh, it seems to me, in the both in the case of the cell and in the case of the termite colony, one of the crucial elements was the free flow of information, uh, in one case by mRNA and the other case by the saliva of those, those workers, the feeding workers. Uh, so this, uh, if you, I'm thinking about net neutrality. Right? <coughs> yeah, no, you're absolutely right. So the question is, both of these show free, 
free and open flow of communication. And that is critical in any sustainable systems. You need systems where really all communication is open to all parties and they work with transparency. It's the only way a system can operate really, really well. And um, that's a really good analogy. Look in our human systems, you know. Um, if you can get, let's say, a business or even uh, any, any human entity that has a mission, a clear mission, the ones that have the most open communication can stay closest to their mission and operate in the most effective ways. Those that don't lose that capacity because once you have open communication, then all the appropriate in inputs being given into decision making, um, new ideas come up, there's all sorts of stuff. But when uh, communication flow is not open and when transparency goes, the system then really it moves dramatically away from self-organization. So this is a part, like when we're talking about human systems, that communication piece is a real important part of that integration. Because if you don't have it, you don't have everything integrated together in functional ways. Are there examples in the natural world where, for the benefit of one part of an ecosystem, it specializes in misinformation? <laughs> you know, there's always exception to the rules. I don't doubt it. I mean, uh, you know, I think the red squirrel is an exception to the rules. I mentioned last week of energy efficiency. I just don't get them at all. But, um, yeah, there's always exception to the rules. And I'll think about that to think if I can think of an example of misinformation because it probably does occur. I'm thinking of a certain radio station. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Can we go so far as to think of the collapse of the Soviet Union's communist system as an example of Yeah, I think the Soviet Union's communist system would be a very good example of lack of transparency, lack of, lack of openness of communication, and all these top-down forces. Top-down forces don't create self-organization, they quash it. So I think there's a lot of burden there that's hard to overcome, and eventually in a system like that, it just becomes not sustainable. And I, you know, I don't know the whole dynamics and that whole that whole sequence of events that you know gave to the fall of that that, that Soviet Union, but um, obviously those are problematic, and uh, you know, really problematic in a democracy. A democracy really needs to thrive on very open communication and transparency. You lose it, you lose your democracy. So it's really important. In the rainforest, there's plants where random mutations led to holes in the leaves that mimic leaves eaten by insects, and that could be the misinformation you're talking about because the leaf randomly has a hole, but it's not an insect hole. It's a hole of a, it's a mutation, mm -hmm. and the bugs sees that as the information that that leaf has already been eaten, but it hasn't been. Yeah, and I think what we saw with like you know camouflage and something like last, like last week, <coughs> structural mimicry. That's certainly misinformation. But I think the question was, is there a place where we get this that's benefiting the whole system and not just the individual? And that's what I have to contemplate on. So we can definitely find it to benefit individual species because they can hide, they can deceive. But the question is, can we have a important maybe functional role where this is happening and have the whole system benefit from it? Um, my guess is no, but I'm thinking about it. It's great great question to think about. Anything else? All right, so I think what we'll do is get to this. Let me see if I can get this all erased. It doesn't leave a residue. Very good, so I'll leave a residue. I think if it's a if it's a sustaining system, then any of those things are by definition part of what makes it sustainable. Oh, that's good. 
The insects that build these mounds don't look very interesting. They certainly don't look like a creature that dominates much of Africa, both in terms of numbers and their effect upon the landscape. The elephant will eat only 10% of this tree that's pushed down. The rest will be devoured by termites. The amount eaten by one individual is tiny, but they exist in numbers that defy the imagination. There are over a million wildebeest on the Serengeti. Even when they're spread out over the plains like this, it's a figure you can never really grasp. Yet to termites, a million is no more than one rather small family. Termites are blind, but they create some of the world's most graceful architecture. They are no bigger than match heads, yet the homes they build weigh tens of tons and maybe over 20 feet tall. The pyramids and man's other great works are pathetic in comparison. The mounds are remarkable in their own right, but also they are focal points in the bush country, and they attract a great variety of visitors. Creatures like the aardvark, and the aardwolf, and a whole alphabet of strange and specialized animals who come to the mound and call it home. This is the story of those mounds of the extraordinary insect society that builds them, and the unlikely collection of creatures that use them as a source of food and shelter. This is the story of those incredible castles of clay. So to give you an idea of scale, that monitor lizard is about five feet long. Inside the fortress, living in almost total darkness, is a complex society of several million insects. Termites are often called white ants, but they are not ants at all. Their nearest relatives are, in fact, cockroaches, and they have been on this earth for at least a hundred million years. The nest is a series of chambers of varying size and purpose, supported by graceful columns and connected by sweeping walkways and tunnels. Their architecture is freeform and based on the arch, with none of the repetitive honeycomb patterns produced by other insect builders, such as bees and wasps. The society is based on a strict division of labor, and each individual plays a clearly defined role in the life of the nest. About 2% of the population are soldiers, equipped with massive heads and powerful jaws. They come in two sizes, major and minor, and all of them are sterile females. The workers come in two sizes and two sexes, and they too are all sterile. The minor workers perform household chores, while the majors are responsible for construction and maintenance. They are the world's greatest builders. Using their saliva as cement, they assemble grain by grain some of the most extraordinary structures in nature. Termite mounds come in a great variety of shapes, sizes, and colors. Where there is heavy rainfall, they deflect it with their own umbrellas. Where it is oven hot, they carry off the heat through tall chimneys. In between those two extreme forms, depending upon the climate, the soil, and the species doing the building, it seems that almost anything goes. skyscraper. Even an average man will be many times the size and weight of the pyramids. The classic mounds are the ten foot high castles found on the savannah and it is these gothic towers that we are going to take a closer look at. The heart of a termite colony is a cell that is built like a nuclear age military command post. Buried a couple of feet below the center of the mound, it has massively thick walls, 
is suspended in space on pillars and can be entered only through a row of tiny portholes round the rim. Easily defended, this is the nerve center of the mind, the royal cell. Permanently sealed inside it are the king and queen. Except that she has eyes, the front end of a termite queen is not so different from that of her subjects. But from the waist down, it's another story. Four inches long, and as thick as a man's gun, she is thousands of times heavier than the workers who attempt her. Beside their queen, the workers look like a ground crew handling a half-inflated airship. The king is much larger than the workers, but is still tiny alongside the queen. In fact, it takes him 15 seconds to walk from one end of his wife to the other. <laughs> the queen is just an enormous egg-laying machine. Every day, and she lives for up to 15 years, she lays almost a third of her own weight in eggs. An incredible 30,000 eggs a day. As the eggs are laid, the workers collect them and carry them off. And with one arriving every few seconds, it is an endless task. Because they are sealed in, the king and queen must be fed by workers who regurgitate their own last meal. <coughs> the soldiers must be fed too, because their jaws are so specialized for fighting that they are unable to feed themselves. The workers also exchange food when they meet, but there's more to it than that. The saliva of each termite contains a mixture of chemicals whose exact combination is determined by the condition of the mound and the needs of the society. The information is passed from mouth to mouth through the colony, and when the queen is fed, she receives a chemical cocktail that gives her a detailed report on the state of her nation. Like the centralized command post that she is, the queen takes in and processes all this information, and then from the other end, she exudes the chemical equivalent of a computer printout that contains all the instructions needed for the running of the mound. For instance, suppose ants attack the colony and a lot of soldiers are killed. In their meetings with each other, the termites register in a purely chemical way that they are making fewer contacts than usual with soldiers. And deep in her cell, the queen receives this information. Nobody knows whether she alters the eggs before she lays them, or whether her chemicals affect the eggs later, through the saliva of the workers who carry them. What is certain is that the next batch of eggs to hatch are mostly soldiers, so that the population is restored to its proper balance. All this mutual feeding is exploited by minute creatures called springtails that spend their lives riding on the backs of the termites. At each exchange of food, the springtail sidles forward and helps itself to a tiny share. Springtails are quite democratic. From queen to commoner, it's just a tiny hop. So, although she's in prison for life, the Queen's influence reaches every one of her millions of subjects. The King has an important role too. If he's removed, the Queen soon starts to lay infertile eggs. They must mate fairly frequently, but how they manage is one of the many secrets still guarded deep inside the royal cell. Above the Queen's cell is a labyrinth of interconnected chambers that forms the main part of the nest. This is the nursery area, where the workers make neat stacks of new laid eggs. The eggs take about three weeks to hatch, and the nursery is always packed with tiny young. Termites don't have a larval stage, like most insects. What emerges from the eggs is a perfectly formed animal, no bigger than a pinhead, a delicate miniature in spun glass. The 
workers have a full-time job keeping the young clean and well-fed, and a hungry baby termite begs for food as appealingly as any puppy. These new generations make up almost 50% of the population. To gather food for all these mouths, the workers dig tunnels that radiate out as far as 50 yards from the mound. When they find food, such as this fallen weaver bird's nest, they come to the surface and in a few hours cover it with a shell of mud. When it has been sealed over and hidden from predators, the workers can feed in safety. The inhabitants of a large mound remove about half a ton of vegetation litter a year. But they're not just keeping Africa tidy. Particularly in the drier areas, the flow of energy will be slowed down because vegetation takes so long to decay. But the termites very quickly eat it. In turn, they themselves are eaten by a great variety of predators. As a result, the nutrients that would otherwise be locked up in the dead wood are rapidly recycled into the system, making it a richer and more varied place. <coughs> Grass and wood contain a high proportion of cellulose, rich in energy, but indigestible, even to a termite. So the workers chew it all up, and back inside the mound, they use it to build convoluted hanging gardens that have the texture and smell of damp cork. The crop in these termite gardens is mushrooms. The mushrooms produce an enzyme that can break down the cellulose into a digestible form. A hungry termite first eats some of the garden material and then nibbles on a mushroom, thus mixing in its stomach one of the most indigestible meals in nature and the magic means of digesting it. The termites cannot live without the mushrooms, and the mushrooms only grow on the gardens created for them by the termites. It's one of the most remarkable associations in nature. The fungus gardens grow in a mass of bun-shaped cells situated above and around the nurseries. Housing and food are now taken care of. But there's another basic problem to be solved. Several million active little bodies, plus the growing process in the fungus gardens, give rise to a lot of heat, to which termites are very sensitive. So they build an air conditioning system, which takes the form of a series of chimneys running through the mound. Warm air rises through these chimneys and is replaced by cool air entering at the base of the mound. If it's a hot wind blowing, the workers go down as much as 150 feet to the water table. At the bottom of these wells, the workers fill their tiny bellies, climb back up to the nest, and spread the water on the walls, so that now the nest is cooled by evaporation. Their control over the system is very precise. By opening or closing the smaller chimneys, and by burying the dampness of the walls, they keep the temperature constant to within one degree of a comfortable 85 degrees Fahrenheit. But there are complications. The air conditioning system provides a perfect, ready-made home for an army of uninvited guests. Soon after dawn, a pack of dwarf mongooses starts to come awake. The youngsters are up first, and their play soon wakes up the adults, who come out to catch the morning sun. Before long, the termite tenement is alive with them.
much as 10 gallons of water a day evaporate from the chimneys of a big mound. Well over a million termite bellyfuls. The chimneys are full of warm, moist air, making them a comfortable retreat for cold-blooded reptiles. The most common is the monitor lizard, who grows to over five feet long and often shares a mound with a family of mongooses. He would eat a mongoose if he could catch one, but in the confines of the chimney, he can't move easily, so it is safe for the youngsters to investigate him. Another animal that often uses termite mounds is the jackal, who hides her pups down the chimneys. It's safer than an ordinary butter. The mud walls of the mound are like concrete. And no predator could possibly dig the puppies out. Having small creatures live in the air conditioning doesn't bother the termites. The insects themselves don't live in the chimneys. They're purely for ventilation. And if one happens to be blocked by a visitor, like an elephant shrew, the termites will open up another. In odd corners of the tunnels are little piles of dead insects, which sometimes move. They are the macabre camouflage of the assassin bug, who covers himself with the bodies of his victims. This half-inch creature pounces on termites and other insects in the chimneys and kills them with an injection from his sharp proboscis. He then reverses the flow, sucks his prey dry, and adds its hollow shell to the gruesome collection on his back. The dwarf mongooses are by far the most common of the mound squatter population. They live in packs of up to 20 animals and are opportunists, feeding on almost anything they can find. One of the youngsters discovers a quail's nest, but he can't open his mouth quite wide enough to break them. And while he's trying, his larger relatives keep making off with them. Soon there's just one left, and he'll fight anyone to keep it. Inevitably, he loses it. But he keeps up the chase, and a broken egg, like half a loaf, is better than nothing at all. The monitor lizard, being cold-blooded, stays in the mound until it's well warmed up by the sun, and then it too sets out hunting. Like the mongooses, it eats anything that comes its way, insects, eggs, small mammals, or fellow reptiles, anything that takes edible to that ceaselessly flickering tongue. The middle of the day is rest time for the mongooses, for the adults anyway. The youngsters never seem to run out of energy. Baby mongooses are just what the spitting cobra would like to find when it comes to the mound to search for food. But the mongooses have spotted him. And now the monitor too is returning to the mound. <coughs> 
Compare the tension and excitement of the mongooses to the grave behavior of the instinct-driven reptiles who go about mortal combat as if they were sleepwalking. The spitting cobra is well named. Its fangs are like hypodermic needles with forward-facing holes. By violently throwing its mouth open, it squeezes the venom sacs and shoots its poison for up to six feet. It would temporarily blind the human, but the monitor is not impressed. to protect them when it is spat at, but it can't protect itself from being bitten, and although it's completely immune to the cobra's deadly venom, it doesn't particularly like it. <laughs> and then crushes the life out of it. And as soon as it's dead, it will be swallowed whole, inch by battered inch. slide down into the chimneys and settle down for the night. It's been quite a day. Tomorrow we'll see the beginning of a whole new season. It's November. The bush country trembles in the heat, waiting for the gift of rain. The hollow shell of mud that was once a weaver bird's nest crumbles and is washed back into the earth. gardens, bring them up to the surface and spread them out on the ground. Now the fungi are able to grow into proper mushrooms, shed their spores, and so complete their reproductive cycle. The termites, meanwhile, build new gardens and plant them with spores collected from the ripening mushrooms. It strains belief to realize that this is a seed crop deliberately planted by a colony of insects. But deep inside the mounds, the rains have triggered an even stranger event. 
In the nurseries, a completely new cast of termite has been created, with large, dark eyes and stubby little wing buds. They will shed their skins once more, freeing their inch-long gossamer wings, and then they'll be ready to take to the air. Outside, around the base of the mound, the workers have made a series of crescent-shaped slits, and with a massive escort of soldiers, they emerge to prepare the ground for the big event. Any strange insects they find are killed and dragged away, and the whole area around the base is cleared of grass and twigs. Just after dark, workers emerge to test the conditions. When all is well, when the ground is soft from rain and there's a gentle breeze, the message is passed inside, and the strange new termites come out into the night. And it is pure fairy tale. Within minutes, the castle that has looked derelict all year shimmers with new life and is sheathed in living silver. These new creatures are princes and princesses who, like Cinderella, have won magical night before returning to darkness and drudgery. They are called Aelates, the winged ones. And unlike workers or soldiers, they are fertile. This flight, synchronized with flights from other mounds in the area, is to disperse them and enable them to find a mate and start new colonies. <coughs> Back at the mound, the workers tidy up go inside and seal up the holes. The magic is over in only about 15 minutes, and it happens only on one night in every year. For other species, it's a daytime event, and daylight reveals more of the mystery. The alates travel on the wind from 50 yards to several miles. When a female lands, she produces a chemical sex attractant, which she fans into the air with flaming wings. To a passing male, even one some distance away, it's irresistible. When a pair get together, they rush off in tandem and appear to be in an unseemly haste to throw off their wings and slip into something comfortable. <laughs> it looks spontaneous, impulsive, but it's simply the next step in a rigidly programmed piece of behavior. The wings have served their purpose, so get rid of them. The next priority is to find a suitable place to start a nest. serve their purpose and will be used no more. The pair will spend the rest of their lives in total darkness. Six months later, a new society is in the making, with a couple of soldiers, a few dozen workers, and even the beginnings of a fungus garden. But for every pair that settle down and start growing mushrooms, there are tens of thousands whose nuptial flight has a very different ending. their bodies are packed with food reserves, alates are good eating, and this annual feast is enjoyed by all, from ants to antelope. Many are eaten as they hatch and never get to fly. Others fly but never get to land. They end up stuck to sticky grass heads or impaled on thorn trees blown there by the wind. And everywhere there are eyes watching.
The nutrients that a few weeks ago were locked up in an old bird's nest are certainly getting around. And it's not just the smaller creatures that benefit. In many parts of Africa, termite alates are a valuable source of protein to the local people. In the Pokot tribe of northern Kenya, termite mounds are individually owned by the men and are passed on to their sons just like any other possession. Their traps are simple, but terribly effective. <coughs> Leafy branches are piled on one side of the mound, then covered with a couple of cow skins. Next, all the flight holes around the base of the mound are blocked, so that the alates are forced to emerge underneath the skins. The edges of the trap are sealed with earth, leaving only one exit at the front, where a smooth-sided circular pit is dug. A wild sisal leaf around the rim to prevent the alates climbing out completes the trap. And then it's just a matter of waiting. The alates emerge under the cow skin, head towards the light, and fall into the pit. A big mound will yield four or five gallons of termites. With night hatching mounds, the Pocot simply dig a hole and attract the alates to it with a burning torch. Some are even fresh, but the bulk of the catch is taken home. Lightly roasted in their own fat, they last for months. They contain about 40% fat and 40% protein, and taste like a mixture of bone marrow and peanut butter. When they are ready, they are tossed to winnow out the wings. These termites may be eaten. But they carry on their war with mankind by eating too. The building materials of people like the Bacot are no more than termite fodder. The Bacot raise their granaries up on stones to keep the termites out. But they will get in in the end. Their very name comes from the Greek termes, the end. In the past, there have been great kingdoms in Africa with monarchs who ruled from vast palaces. But the thrones were made of wood, and the palaces were made of timber and grass. And today they are no more. Much of the history of Africa has disappeared into the belly of the termite. Another creature that feeds on alates, even more colorful than the Pocot women, is the red and yellow barbet. But whilst everything else we've seen has been eating them, the barbet appears to be taking them back into the mound. And that's just what it is doing. The barbet nests by tunneling a hole into the side of a mound, and there it rears its young. The hole is well up on the walls and doesn't interfere with the termites, so they in turn don't bother the birds.
If the mound they're living in has just produced its aliens, there's a plentiful supply of food right on the doorstep. But you can get just too much of a good thing. These babies are quite literally fed up with termites. The barbet is one creature that digs holes into the mound without causing any harm. But there is another animal whose tunneling is on a much more epic scale. This is the art bark, the first word in the dictionary, the last word in anteater design. Its huge ears can pick up the sound of termites working below ground. That great snout is packed with sensitive receptors and has a hairy filter to keep out the dust. Those claws can open up the hardest of mounds, and once the termites are exposed, they'll come to a sticky end. But it's early yet and the aardvark curls up for a little more sleep. When she does leave her burrow, she does so with a bang, leaping well clear so as to confuse any predator that might have been lying in wait. For several seconds, she pauses to listen and sniff the air for danger. Only when she's sure that the coast is clear does she relax and amble off on the hunt. We know she's a female because of that white tail, which makes it easier for her baby to follow her in the dark. She will dig up any termites she finds in their tunnels just below the surface. But she will also pay a nightly visit to the mounds in her territory. Their digging powers are legendary in Africa. A burrowing aardvark can easily stay ahead of two or three men with picks and shovels, and it can rip open the concrete-like mounds with ease. An adult aardvark weighs about 120 pounds. That such a large animal is able to expend so much energy in getting its food gives a good indication of just how rich a diet termites are. She doesn't lick the termites up from the broken surface. That way she will take in a lot of earth. She first breaks open the tunnel, and then with plenty of puffing from that long snout, blows away the loose earth before she uses her tongue. After feeding for a while, she'll move on to a fresh mouth. An aardvark seldom does any serious damage, but as it digs deep inside, the chimneys send up puffs of dust, like little smoke signals of distress.
Most of the mines in an aardvark's territory have holes dug in them, and these provide perfect homes for creatures like the porcupine, who likes to live in burrows, but whose feet are too weak to dig in hard ground. are well-behaved animals in queues. There's just no way they can be pushy. <coughs> Finally, he tires of waiting, lifts her quills with his nose, gives her a little nudge and gets her moving. into this formidable covering of needle-sharp spikes. But another animal that lives in old aardvark holes has an even stranger armor. Except for its belly and the sides of its face, the scaly anteater, or pangolin, is covered with layers of hard, horny tiles. In some areas, it is called the bushfish. It carries most of its weight on its hind legs, with its heavy tail acting as a balance. And in its search for ants and termites, it bumbles absent-mindedly around the bush, looking for all the world like a clockwork artichoke. <laughs> when she is hunting, the cheetah often uses a termite mound as a vantage point to search for prey. But right now, she's just puzzled. The pangolin's protection was once thought to be made of the same material as tortoise shell, or even of highly compressed hair, like rider horn. But it's now thought to be the skin itself that has evolved into these hard, sharp scales. pangolin tucks in its head. It's been through all this before and knows that if it curls up and lies still for long enough, the cheetah will eventually get bored and go away. Yet another odd creature that moves into old aardvark holes is the aard wolf. And now we've come full circle, for like the aardvark, it too is specialized for feeding on termites. But this jackal-sized animal doesn't dig them up. Its legs are too frail for that. Instead, it finds them on the surface and licks them up with a broad and sticky tongue. The termites that forage on the surface are called harvesters. They cut up grass into short lengths and then drag it down into their nests below ground. The odd wolf finds them by homing in on the tiny high frequency noises that their jaws make as they snip through the grass stems. species of harvester, and because it can store food in the nest, it only needs to come to the surface occasionally and is therefore not a reliable source of food. But there is another, more primitive species that does not store its food and so has to forage on the surface every day. Instead of jaws, the soldiers of this species have snouts like little guns through which they fire a sticky fluid that smells of turpentine. wolf has a completely bare muzzle that's easy to look clean when he's been shot at. 
But after he's fed for a minute or two on a patch of these termites, the percentage of soldiers goes up. The turpentine flavor gets too much, and so he moves on. With almost 90% of its diet being just one species of termite, the hard wolf is one of the most specialized mammals on Earth. When the aardvark digs into a mound, it normally does only minor damage around the edge of the nest. But sometimes, if one is really hungry, it will tear the heart out of a nest and leave it shattered and exposed. Responding to the inrush of cool air, the workers come pouring out to repair the damage, and the soldiers sound their clicking alarm by beating their heads on the ground. In emergencies like this, individual termites show almost human altruism. They will risk their lives to defend and rebuild the nest. The royal cell has been broken open, and the queen is helpless and exposed. Left in the open, she will soon die. She must be rescued immediately. But at the edge of the broken nest, there is an even greater threat. A scout but an army ant column a deadly enemy has discovered the damage. If the termite soldier wins, the workers may have time to seal up the nest. But if the army ant wins and goes off for reinforcements, the nest will be in mortal danger. It's difficult to believe that these creatures are blind. Guided only by chemical stimuli, they cooperate to push, pull, and lift the queen, and slowly, unbelievably, that vast body is moved towards safety. frontier, the army ant has won. Even as some workers heave the queen inside the nest, others are building a wall behind her. Termite soldiers are designed for a defensive role. If the workers could repair most of the damage, the soldiers could defend any small gaps. But there isn't time. The termites and army ants will meet in open combat.
the queen is dead, and an army marches in to pillage her castle. Even if a million of her subjects survive, there is no way they can replace her. They will continue to live their little lives, to build and grow mushrooms and feed each other, but without a queen to renew it, the life of the mound will soon flicker and die. Now, when the rains come, instead of new life, they bring erosion and decay. With no new building, the mounds become rounded, and elephants, scratching their itches like great sanding machines, wear them away still more. system if you're producing more than you need and others can benefit from it. So you have internal complexity but also beneficial to everything outside your community. Yeah, yeah. And I mean the point is, yes, it's very much an anti-entropic system. It's taking in all this energy, you're getting the surplus. But <clears throat> whenever energy is consumed, it is lost. I mean, we often think that you know energy can 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 cycle and it can't. It's a one way flow. When, we, um, when any organism takes in energy into its body and stores it away, let's say, in fat, well, that energy can be passed from animal to animal to animal. But whenever those fat molecules are broken down, the energy is accessed from them, that energy eventually just leaves as heat and goes back out to outer space. So um, it is a one-way flow, and luckily there's a great amount that's being captured, and then that can create you know, support the whole system. <clears throat> so I have two questions, two very puzzling things about the video, I think. The first is the assassin bug. This creature is living in an environment where nothing can see. So why is it covering itself with dead bodies when the termites are blind anyway? So you can't see what's going on. <coughs> it could be. It could be smell. That's one possibility. There could be a sense of smell that all of a sudden, hmm, I think there's a lot of termites around here, nothing bad. Could do, be that. Do the termites um, take all the dead and bring it to one location? They will collect and um, they can put this stuff into their compost heaps and, you know, then use that for material. Yeah. Um, dogs do the same thing. Yes, they can, they can cover themselves with a smell, if it's a smell. Yeah. Um, Is it tactile camouflage? It, it could be that. I mean, it, it could be, it could be sexual selection. It could be that Males cover themselves with this thing to attract females, just basically saying, you know, I've got to be good, look at what I've done, you know. <laughs> I'm a good provider or something, yeah. Could, could this be uh, 
left over from some previous stage of evolution when uh, the assassin bugs ate something else? It, it, it could be. I mean, you know, um, things that are not really detrimental can be maintained and really have no functional purpose. I think this probably does have a functional purpose, but I'm not sure what it does. So the other question I had is that aardvark ripping into the heart of that nest. That's not a very sustainable thing. You know, you'd be much better off not destroying your nest because then you have this constant supply of termites that are being produced, 30,000 every day. So you would think there'd be a lot of selection pressure against doing that. That would be sort of energy wasteful to get rid of your colony because how many colonies would you have maybe in your territory? I don't know how big a territory of an aardvark is, but um, that might be counterproductive. So any ideas about that? Well, they mentioned that it only happens when they're really, really hungry, that they, uh -huh. they avoid you mostly. And that's, that's what the storyline says. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's very possible that could have been manipulated for that last footage to make that sort of a real dramatic ending of having, you know, this, this ant termite war and then the destruction of the mound and the loss of the mound so you can see the full cycle. So it may be that it's very rare that our parts do this, and that might have been a manipulation in the movie. I'm not sure. I'm not sure that if you would know the answer to this, but for the tribe that were stewards of the mounds, do you know if they might take a defensive role towards you know something such as at the end where there was a you know, destructive action towards the mound? Good question. I mean, you would think they would. I mean, if you know, if this is an important seasonal food source, yeah, you'd think that they'd be protective of them and would be looking out for them. So that's that, that's a good supposition. I would think that'd be the case. And then I, a secondary question would be: Would you then feel that to be an improvement in the overall um, ecosystem or a um, neutral action or? Um, whether, you know, them protecting the mounds and then taking a large amount of that energy from the mounds would be an improvement or not, my guess is it's working. I don't know if it's an improvement because it means then less of that termite energy is being distributed throughout the whole system. So right. it may, you know, impact the whole system in ways that uh, is not as great. Mm -hmm. Although, you know, you'd have to look at, right, so let's say four to five gallons compared to how much biomass there's a termination. Maybe it's not that big of a deal. Maybe they're not taking that much. I don't know. I mean probably multiple negative feedback loops. One inside the mountain saying, mm -hmm. oh things are disappearing, stuff went outside. Or the humans saying, oh if we overuse this, we won't be here next year because yeah. they pass it on intergenerationally. Yeah. They're learning how to tend it. And obviously I think that's the case is that they've got to be um, harvesting in a way that maintains these colonies and maintains the system because right. you know um, these mounds can be active for decades and decades and decades. So if they're harvesting every year, they got to do it in a way that's not uh, increasing their viability. The harvesting exactly. Thing. exactly. Very hard, much harder to get. Yeah. <laughs> All right. We'll stop there today, and then we'll meet again next week and, and, and start shifting into looking at uh, this principle of self-organization in human systems.